This episode of The Energy Show is proudly sponsored by Sunlight & Power, the Bay Area's leading commercial and residential solar contractor. SLP has been designing and installing photovoltaic, battery backup, and solar thermal solutions since 1976. Help fight climate change. Go solar with Sunlight & Power today. So, you want to save the world with clean energy? Make money doing it? Confused about the economic and technical realities of residential and commercial solar, batteries, heat pumps, EVs? Want the real world scoop on new energy technologies, not manufacture hype? Then tune in to the weekly energy show hosted by Barry Cinnamon. Insights from Barry's 40 plus years in the solar and energy industry will help you understand the future ways we'll generate and consume energy. And now, here's Barry. Welcome to this week's Energy Show. On this week's show, we're talking about the history of Earth Day. Now, Earth Day started out to clean up air and water pollution. The words global warming hadn't even occurred to Al Gore. And now the Earth has warmed up over 1.5 degrees C, and that inconvenient truth trend continues. The Earth is getting hotter, just as Al Gore predicted. Now, let's dive into how Earth Day's focus has changed over the past 54 years. Kind of set the clock back. There's this guy, his name was Walter Cronkite, Uncle Walter, people used to call him. Very famous journalist, TV journalist on CBS. He set the stage for the first Earth Day. His address on CBS on April 22nd, 1970, prefaced with his comments, it's a day set aside for a nationwide outpouring of mankind seeking its own survival. Pretty prescient. I mean, that's kind of what we're focused on. So, okay, I'm a boomer. I'm at the generation 1946 to 1964. Let's just say it was somewhere in between there. All right. My big theme, observations of the evolution of Earth Day. The Earth Day efforts started out to fix the most noticeable apparent environmental issues. They were in your face. <laughs> Things like rivers catching fire, trash on highways, cities cloaked in smog, very little pushback from anybody. It was a pretty universal thing. You know, we really wanted to solve these problems. Now, as the decades progressed, incumbent industries started to fight back fight back against the cost for these environmental improvements. Oil and gas industries, yeah, you want, they wanted to sell more oil, so more efficient vehicles wasn't good. Transportation, power generation, utilities wanted to generate power in the way that would be most profitable for them. They didn't want to put scrubbers on their smokestacks to take out the pollution. And this is just a rationale from their own profit motive. Selfish, yes. Legal, yes. Good for mankind, no. So here we go. Let's kind of dive into more of the history on Earth Day. And this is a reminder for Generation X. Those are my listeners who were born between 1965 and 1980. So here's what the environment looked like in 1970. Like many developing countries around the world, there were cars, there was trucks, there was factories belching smoke. The smoke was, the visible smoke was mostly particulates, sulfur oxide, nitrogen oxide, you know, bits of combusted carbon. The rivers were used as dumping grounds. I mean, you still see this in third world countries around the world, but that's just where you dump stuff, including raw sewage. There was litter along roads and highways. I still remember that Native American, that Indian picture of the, the Indian chief being angry about somebody throwing a trash bag right in front of him. But there was actually people are thinking that all this smoke and activity, that was the smell of prosperity. But in some cities like LA and New York City, there was visible smog. And that led to the Clean Air Act and vehicle pollution controls. Now, cars are extremely clean of pollutants, other than CO2, which is unavoidable when you're burning fossil fuels. So you don't see smoke coming out. It smells pretty clean. There's no, all the fuel in there, all the gas is burned. I listen, remember the smell of my old 1970s cars. You can actually smell the fossil fuels in there. Now that you really don't smell anything out of the exhaust of a car. All right, so I'm coming back to just the year before Earth Day, summer of 1969, the moon landing. The Mets winning, uh, both, you know, completely otherworldly events. There's a river called the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland. It kept catching fire. Can you imagine a river, water, just catching fire? Because it was covered with oil slicks, with bubbling pollution, dead rats, debris floating along. In the 60s, a very influential book came out by Rachel Carson 
called Silent Spring, and that really raised public awareness about pollution and the dangers to our health. The book sold over half a million copies in the 60s. And I was kind of kicking out of this when I was watching the first episode of The Three-Body Problem. Even in China, that book kind of got out there, at least as far as the movie goes. All right, so that this, all these things kind of fired people up, and it led to the first Earth Day on April 22nd, 1970. 20 million Americans, 10% of the population, took to the streets. There was political alignment between Democrats and Republicans. Richard Nixon is one of the most environmentally influential presidents that we've had. So the first Earth Day led to the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, the National Environment Education Act, OSHA, the Occupational Self Safety and Health Act, the Clean Air Act, and two years later, Congress passed the Clean Water Act. But the environment continued to be severely stressed through the 1970s in a lot of different ways. There was the 1973 Arab oil embargo. I remember this vividly. Gasoline was really expensive, the equivalent of $12 a gallon today. There was such a shortage of gasoline that you had to buy gas based on the last digit in your license plate. If it was even, you can line up to get gas on an even day. If it was odd, you can line up to get gas on an odd day. Lines were really, really long. They changed the national speed limit from 60 or 65 to 55. This is, I think Jimmy Carter did this. And, you know, if you drive slowly, you're a little bit more efficient. There's less wind resistance. Of course, it takes you longer to get everywhere. But that's one of the results of the Arab oil embargo. Now, they were kind of looking at other forms of pollution. In 1978, there's this place called Love Canal, or the Love Island Community. 21,000 tons of toxic chemicals were dumped in an area that eventually became a residential neighborhood. Lots of people got sick. It took them a long time to figure out what was going on. So that was a huge environmental mess. They had to move people out and try and clean it up. And you know, still, nobody wants to walk on that dirt. 1979, Three Mile Island the first really big nuclear disaster in the world. There's been others that might have been covered up back then, but this was the first big one. There was a nuclear reactor in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It melted down. When they kind of went back and looked at it, they labeled it as a level five disaster on the nuclear event scale. There was a loss of coolant and a partial core meltdown. So the core of the reactor gets really hot. There's water coolant to keep it from getting really hot, but there was a power failure. There wasn't enough coolant, and the nuclear core got really, really hot, and it started to melt it down. There was a small release of radioactive gases, but it was very traumatic. Personally, I got involved in solar and interested in solar as a result of the Arab oil embargo in Three Mile Island, and that's kind of what I studied in college. I was inspired by using solar for heating buildings and hot water. At the time, photovoltaics, way, way too expensive. All right, so let's kind of go on to the next decade. This is a reminder for millennials born in 1981 to 1996. So Earth Day in the 80s. In 1980, the Superfund law was passed, and this is a result of pollution and health disasters at Love Island Community and elsewhere. Since 1980, the Superfund has cleaned up over 750 polluted sites. 1982, Save the Whales. This is something that was championed by Greenpeace. This is the International Whaling Convention, really to prevent the decimation of these huge marine mammals. And then, in 1986, Chernobyl happened. Oops! kind of showed that Three Mile Island was not a random event. Chernobyl was what they call a level seven disaster on the nuclear event scale, even worse than Three Mile Island. There was a flawed reactor design and inadequate safety procedure. By the way, Chernobyl is in Ukraine, which at the time was part of the Soviet Union. As a result of this problem, there was a power surge that damaged the fuel rods in one of the reactors. There was an explosion. Boom! Radioactive material got blown over a huge area, and there was a meltdown. And this wind, I think, kept going towards the west. And lots of people throughout Ukraine were exposed to radiation. 300,000 people were exposed. And there was dispersed radioactive material all across Europe. So Soviet Union had a reactor, wasn't very safe. It blew up. It polluted Europe. And there was a definite effect from that. So brings us to the 1990s. And so in 1990, they had the first intergovernmental panel on climate change, or the IPCC report. You know, we talk about this on our podcast every year or so. So scientists saw global warming writing on the wall. They saw that the more CO2 that's emitted, the earth is gradually heating up. But not enough people paid attention. But there were some countries that started to take action. 1991, Sweden passed the first carbon tax. 
And, you know, when you look at it economically and, and from a simplistic standpoint, if you tax carbon emissions, which are mostly CO2, when I kind of look at all the different options, that's the best way to mitigate global warming. Now, economists say that greenhouse gas emissions, let's just call it CO2. So CO2 is a negative externality. It sounds like a couple of weird uh, words. But basically, if you tax this negative externality, it basically is a simple way to add costs to bad behavior. So when a utility or industry is doing something wrong, but they don't directly pay for it, if you tax them for that bad behavior, they will change. So carbon taxes are the most effective way to do this, and Sweden was the first country to take action. 1997, the Kyoto Protocol, that was the International Treaty on Climate Change. 37 industrial economies agreed to cut their emissions, and 100 developing economies, including China and India, were exempted. Now, 1997, President Clinton signed the Kyoto Protocol but Congress refused to ratify the protocol over fossil fuel industry objections. No surprise, right? Cutting back emissions means you're going to, basically the easiest way to do this is to sell less fossil fuels. They managed to hamstring that. That was back in 1997. All right, let's look at Earth Day in the 2000s. And this is a reminder for Generation Z, 1997 to 2012. Earth Day 2000 focused on energy and the impact on the environment. So now we kind of cleaned up the pollution in the water and a little bit in the air. We cleaned up the rivers. It's better. So that's how we're kind of looking at where most of these emissions are coming from. It's basically from burning fossil fuels in the energy industry. And in my view, this Earth Day 2000 really raised the awareness and the ire of fossil fuel companies. They realized, boy, if this thing keeps happening, it's going to cut into our profits. And then next step, 2001, George Bush became president and he formally removed the United States from the Kyoto Protocol. So, you know, we're starting to see this going back and forth. I remember 2001, this is when Drill Baby Drill became popular. It's still kind of out there and, you know, the candidate Trump is also promoting it. Now, this was George W. Bush, not to be confused with his father, President George H.W. Bush, who was president from 1989 to 1993. So throughout the 2000s going on, Almost every other country signed onto the Kyoto Protocol, except for a few like the U.S. that said, hey, we don't want to pay for it. All right. Now let's go to the next decade, Earth Day in the 2010. Well, these disasters kept happening. And it's kind of interesting that the disasters keep happening because our economy keeps getting better. There's more companies. There's more, more possibilities for disasters. And there's more communication about it. So I wouldn't be surprised if there was big disasters happening 30, 40, 50, 100 years ago, but nobody talked about them. There wasn't an the internet. So 2010, Deepwater Horizon oil spill. There's a drilling rig that was off the coast of the U.S. and Mexico. There was a methane explosion. And they were drilling for oil way underwater. 200 million gallons of oil was spilled. And after years and years of, of lawsuits, British Petroleum, who was running the rig, there was another company that you know managing, but the oil was going to British Petroleum. They got fined. Big freaking deal. And it's just interesting how our legal system, there's a big fine, and then those fines go down, down, down. They get this delayed forever. 2011. Well, there's this nuclear reactor in a town called Fukushima, Japan. It was another level seven disaster on the nuclear event scale, just as bad as Chernobyl. There was a tsunami that happened from an earthquake, and that tsunami flooded and damaged the three active reactors that knocked out their backup power. And so since they didn't have backup power, they weren't able to cool the reactors, and that led to overheating meltdowns, not just one, meltdowns, and evacuation of the whole area. Much of the area is still evacuated. They got millions and millions of tons and gallons of of radioactive material and water that they just don't know what to do with. These water leaks continue to kind of leak out. You don't want to buy fish from that area. And that's really true. So it really hasn't been completely cleaned up. In fact, they're still saying that there's still danger in that reactor because they can't get in there and basically clean it up. 2012, (laughs) starting in 2012, continue even now. There's this pipeline called the Keystone Pipeline. That's basically a big oil pipeline that was going from Canada, where they have lots of oil and oil sands, down to Houston, where they do the refining. So this was a great idea for fossil fuel companies. We can pipe this oil all the way down to Houston. It's going to make it cheaper for us to get that to market. And they needed permits. It's just not one permit. They probably needed dozens of permits going through different places and communities and states. So the permit for the Keystone Pipeline was approved by President Bush. 
then revoked by President Obama, then approved by President Trump, and then now revoked by President Biden. And depending on who becomes president again next term, it could be approved again. It's just like a tennis match going back and forth, a textbook example of how permits can delay projects, good or bad. All right, 2012, another disaster, Hurricane Sandy. This was a tropical storm that turned into one of the biggest hurricanes ever off the New Jersey, New York coast. It killed 147 people, blackouts in 8 million homes, and $70 billion worth of damages. And it made crystal clear that severe storms and rising sea levels make formerly safe coastal areas vulnerable. So from even a minor amount of global warming, does two things. First, when the air is warmer, it can hold more water. It's got more energy. And that water could then result in bigger storms, warm water. And the same thing happens with hurricanes. You see them proceeding west across the Atlantic Ocean. As they get into warm areas, the hurricanes kind of, you know, get really big. And when they get to land where it's not as warm, it's cool down, then the hurricanes diminish. But what this hurricane demonstrated very clearly, that severe storms and even small amounts of rising sea level, yeah, maybe you know six inches or so, that can make formerly safe coastal areas very vulnerable. Bigger storms, water's a little bit higher than it was, sea level's a little higher, it creates a bigger disaster. So yeah, my advice, don't pay too much for beachfront property. And the insurance rates have gone up, and now that the state and the federal government are actually trying to help cover those insurance things, but that's not possible to continue to rebuild these communities on the, on the coast when these disasters are becoming more common and worse. So, yeah, you can still buy a house on the beach, but you may not be able to afford insurance. 2015, the Paris Climate Accords, and now this is kind of getting even more organized, and there was some this specific measurement that was placed on the wall. We want to keep global warming below 2 degrees C and as close as possible to 1.5 degrees C. That's been the goal for like nine years. No global warming below 1.5 degrees C. So trying to keep the temperatures from going up. Obama joined the Paris Climate Agreement, but then Trump exited the Paris Climate Agreement. And we're in the company of two countries that are, you know, it's not that great a, a group, Libya and Yemen. Biden rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement. Now, by the way, just this year, 2024, it's pretty clear that we are now over 1.5 degrees C and it keeps getting worse. And so that brings us to the 2020s. David Wallace Wells, the author of The Uninhabitable Earth, said about climate change, it's worse, much worse than you think. And it's true. 2023 was the hottest year since we've had accurate records going back to 1850. At the end of 2023, the global temperature measurements were 1.45 degrees C above pre-industrial levels. So 2024, now we've passed it and there's no one in sight. It's not slowing down. It's actually keeping going and maybe even faster. So what's going on this decade so far with Earth Day? First, There's a lot of attention and celebration, but in my opinion, there continues to be a lack of action. We passed the 1.5 degrees threshold, and people may remember all the efforts we had not to let global warming go over 10 degrees C. We're doing all these great things, but we're still burning fossil fuels at a very fast rate, and temperatures still going up. We've experienced the hottest 10 years ever over the last decade. And so let's look at some of these climate change conferences. The UN Climate Change Conference that we recently had, this was in 2024, and it was the COP 2028. The recommendations were this like terrible word salad that meaningless. The specific commentary from the UN Climate Change Conference was diluted to the point of delusion. What they said was, we will transition away from fossil fuels and energy systems in a just orderly and equitable manner, accelerating action in this critical decade so as to achieve net zero by 2050 in keeping with the science. Lawyers wrote this. There's dozens of ways that fossil fuel companies could squirm around it. You know, they say it's not just, it's not orderly, it's not equitable. We're accelerating, but we're accelerating from zero and, you know, basically making no significant impact. So it shouldn't be a surprise that this climate change conference was kind of so worthless other than this word salad recommendation because Dr. Sultan Al-Jabbar was president 
of COP28, which was held in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, which is one of the biggest oil production countries in the world. And it's no coincidence that although Al Jabbar is the UAE's environment minister, that sounds kind of good, right? He's the environment minister. His day job is also the CEO of the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. So absolute classic case of the fox in charge of the hen house. Although this was the first ever COP reference to possibly, possibly reducing fossil fuel use, there's no explicit reduction in fossil fuels that were declared at the conference, no hard commitment on action or timing, and they get to interpret the science any way they choose. So basically, we're going to see fossil fuel companies and countries continuing to mine and burn fossil fuels just as they see fit. So kind of looking at this realistically, with this fossil fuel reality in mind for the next few years, first, you have to realize that these critical environmental policies have a tendency to be started and stopped like a tennis match as presidents change. The Paris Agreement, the Keystone Pipeline, EPA rules, etc. So, you know, we may see, depending on the, the sentiment of president in power in their party, that we may have good environmental regulations, we may have bad environmental regulations, good ones may be canceled under unfriendly presidents. All right, so second... It's crystal clear to me that fossil fuel companies are going all out to slow down carbon-free energy. Don't look at what they say. Don't look at their pronouncements that they care about the environment and that they're going to burn clean coal and they're going to clean up their emissions. It's thermodynamically impossible. And they're companies. They're trying to make the best profit they can. They don't want to increase their expenses by cleaning up the pollution. They don't want to reduce their revenues by drilling for less oil. They want to drill, baby, drill. And that's the reality. you got to look at what they're doing. Now, third, kind of going into utilities, even though there are entities like utilities that are ostensibly regulated, they're going to do everything in their power to maximize their profits. And in many cases, that's not in the most environmentally friendly way. They're going to ignore or sidestep environmental safety and consumer cost issues. Typical example here in the U.S. and particularly California, the utilities are pushing to build more natural gas plants. Now, absolutely positively, without a shadow of a doubt, we can generate most of that power through clean, renewable rooftop solar. But they don't make money on that. So they're pushing for more natural gas plants and to repower existing power plants that are close to the U.S. distribution network. So... It's kind of a dilemma, and they're not being regulated. Now, the good news, you probably all know, you're listening to the podcast, is that clean energy sources, wind, solar, batteries, they're cost-effective. They make sense, but they don't make as much profits for the utilities. And so, you know, we're looking at some of these ideas, you know, as far as possible end-user systems to use these non-fossil fuel sources. I mean, solar's a typical example. You can put solar on the roof of your commercial building. You can put solar on community centers, on parking lots. You can put solar on your home. You're going to basically have clean energy and it's going to be cheaper. Now, some of these alternatives that are being pushed, and there's, there's billions of dollars going into investments in things like carbon capture and sequestration. That's basically taking the carbon dioxide out of combustion fossil fuels thermodynamically it doesn't make sense it's very expensive or direct air capture that's to like oh let's take the co2 that's already in the air and let's kind of filter that out the co2 is so incredibly diffuse i think it's like 400 parts per million it's incredibly expensive and it takes an enormous amount of energy for the fans and the cleaning systems to take that carbon dioxide out much better just to not burn those fossil fuels at all But the fossil fuel companies are saying, well, we can fix it if we just keep trying this. You know, kind of looking forward to battery storage just taking off. There's more and more solar going in. Ultimately, I think hydrogen is going to be a very, very good storage and transportation fuel of the future. And hydrogen is really easy to make by splitting the hydrogen atoms from the oxygen in plain old water. So there are a lot of experimental plants going in where they're built adjacent to huge solar farms or wind farms. And the energy from those solar and wind farms is used to split the hydrogen off from the oxygen and store the hydrogen. It makes a lot of sense. But it's going to take time to scale. So in the meantime... There's two things that we have to do. First, since we're already past the 1.5 degrees threshold, we should do everything we can to kind of slow that rate of global warming down. But we're not going to do it right away. So what we must do is adapt 
to these higher temperatures, adapt to these higher sea levels, adapt to harsher weather. That may mean that, you know, really, really hot areas around the world, humans aren't going to be able to live and work there. It may mean that if you're, if, if there's communities, roads, highways, civilization near the water, they have to move inland a few miles because the sea levels are going to keep going up. And you just can't build a dike or a dam to keep that water away. It's going to keep climbing. Inevitably, because we're not slowing down the rate of global warming, the sea levels will rise, the storms will worsen, and there'll be more severe wildfires. It's just a reality. So we need to adapt to that reality. The second, we have to continue to strive to reduce the costs of clean energy systems. That means solar and storage on every sunny rooftop. That means heat pumps and EVs for everyone. And the economics are great for these solutions. Problem is you've got incumbent industries like utilities and fossil fuel companies that are creating regulations and laws or skirting those. But without a doubt, there's superior customer economics for these clean energy sources. We just have to get the middlemen out of the way. Okay, that's all the time we have on this week's Energy Show. Thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. And if you missed any of today's show, you can always go to the Energy Show website at energyshow.biz and listen to the podcasts. This episode of the Energy Show was proudly sponsored by Sunlight and Power the Bay Area's leading commercial and residential solar contractor. SLP has been designing and installing photovoltaic, battery backup, and solar thermal solutions since 1976. Help fight climate change. Go solar with sunlight and power today.